The Finkel question is the story of friends, three men essentially, one of whom is not Jewish but would like to be Jewish, two of whom are Jewish but are Jewish in very, very different ways. And they, it was planned originally to be a book, it was planned originally not so much to be a book about Jewishness or Zionism or attitudes to Zionism, which is what the book became, it was a book about friendship. I wanted to write a book about men and friendship. It's not, there are not that many books about male friends. Women friends, yes. Male friends, not often written about. And I'm interested in, in, in male friendships. I'm interested in the affections that men have or are sometimes embarrassed to express to one another. I'm interested in the rivalries. I'm interested in the arguments that men have. And that was what I first of all wanted to write about, male friendships. And then it became to do with the time I was writing it actually and to do with the politics of the Middle East which I'm not going to talk about now and the, the politics of the Middle East and the way the politics of the Middle East was being, that were being reported in the English press started to filter through into the book and more and more these characters who by this time had a life of their own were reacting to what was going on over there almost as though they were reading the papers as I was reading the papers and their friendship and enmities and disagreements are played out against this backdrop of news coming in in the Middle East about how what's happening in Israel, how people feel about the relations between Israel and the Palestinians for and against and so on. And all this is intertwined all along with their friendships, with their, the flagging of their friendships, the, um, the, the renewed enthusiasm of their friendships. And then as women start to play a part too, um, because two of these men ha are, are widowed, um, uh, <laughs> One of them would actually almost like to be widowed because he envies the other two their grief. One of the men, Julian, happens to be the non-Jewish one, almost wants to be Jewish because he feels Jews have got an access to grief, to passion, um, that he would like to have. It's absurd. Um, nonetheless, he would like to have it. And he realizes something is wrong when he thinks, I'm envying these two men, their bereavement. Part of what he's envying, of course, is the fact that they were once in love but they were in love very differently. And that's another of the things that they argue about, being in love, how to be in love, what grief is, what you owe to the memory of somebody you've loved, and so on and so on. I don't know whether they change the meaning of friendship, but the friendships are, friendships always have to have a context. You're not just a friend in, the, in a, you know, in a, in a, in a desert, um, unless you're living in a desert and you've got no news. They are, the politics and the religion become, if you like, the context. Of their, of their friendship. So between, between Julian, the non-Jewish the, the, the non centre of the book really, um, and his philosopher friend, they were at school together and um, the non-Jewish boy, the non-Julian is interested in the Jewishness of his friends. He feels that he's got some qualities that he hasn't got. Um, he envies it, he admires it, he's perplexed by it, he's puzzled by it. But he also sort of feels there's a, there's a lack of fidelity in the, in the school friend of his. Um, because the, 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 uh, the school friend who is Finkler um, and who is widowed um, is false to everything. He's false to the memory of his wife. He's false to the family in which he grew up. And Julian wonders if he's false even to Jewishness. He's become passionately anti-Zionist. Um, I certainly wouldn't say that you can't be a good Jew and also be anti-Zionist. I think it's perfectly possible. But in the case of in the case of Finkler, being hating the political aspect of Jewishness at the moment, particularly in the Middle East, goes with his failure to be loyal to anything. And it's partly the story of his loyalty or disloyalty. And they argue about, they are all arguing about lo loyalty and disloyalty. And that certainly is something, in my experience, whether they're Jews or they're not Jews, and whether Gaza is happening or Gaza isn't happening, that is a subject that men, that men talk about and look at. Men wonder about, you know, why some of them are more faithful to their wives than others. Um, and often you see a man who's spent his life being faithful to his wife, kind of envying men who've had a wilder um, less, law, less, less faithful um, life and vice versa too and people who've chased around and been faithful to no one look at somebody who has loved one woman all their lives and, and they think well that's admirable and there is a man in that state the, the Libor, the nicest man in the book 
the emotional heart of the book, I think, for me as I was writing, increasingly, a man of 90, whose wife has just died after 60 years of marriage, and his feelings, his emotions, his, in, his inability to find a way of staying alive now um, without his wife, um, is, at the heart, is actually at the heart of the book. He can't forget her. He just can't forget her. So he looks at the other, that man who's, who, who has also lost a wife and who has forgotten her in five minutes. He looks at him in bemusement, sometimes wondering if he remembered less, would he be happy? Because to remember with great intensity is a terrible burden. It's a burden to remember. This is something that, that we all talk about, all human beings talk about what we owe to memory. For Jews it's very, very important because Jews understand themselves in memory. Every Jewish festival is an act of remembrance. We were told everywhere after the Holocaust, never forget, never forget. So contemporary Jews, even the least religious uh, contemporary Jew, bears a memory, bears a burden of remembrance. And yet we also know that, that excessive remembrance can create a kind of bitterness. There's a famous character in Cloud Landsman's famous film Shoah, in which various people who lived through the Holocaust went to the camps to talk about their memories. And one, one man who, who was in Auschwitz for many years um, says he is consumed with bitterness. Um, there's nothing he can do. He cannot forget. He cannot forgive. And he says, if you could take my heart out and lick my heart, it would poison you. Very, very upsetting moment. And you feel at the same time, he's right never to forget. He's right to remember. He's right even to be bitter. Bitterness has its own justification. On the other hand, look at the damage it does to him. Never to forget does damage to the rememberer. And that's one of the things that the book's about too. Well, you have to read the book to get the answer to that. But the Finkler question is itself, the way the, the, way the title first appears is... Julian imagines that um, all Jews, Julian, the non-Jewish the non character, when he meets his friend Finkler at school, thinks all Jews should be called Finklers. If they were called Finklers, it'd be nice if they were called Finklers. And that terrible phrase, the Jewish question, if it were called the Finkler question, might sound kinder. The phrase, the Jewish question, of course, refers to several books that were written about about the identity of Jews, some in the 19th century, one of them by Karl Marx. Karl Marx wrote a book called The Jewish Question. And the Jewish question in these books was normally, what do we do to get rid of the Jews? It wasn't, you know, uh, how are we going to meet a Jew or how to behave with Jews. Is what are we going to do to get rid of the Jews, either to destroy them or just to have them merge in and vanish. In other words, the Jews were a problem. So when Julian Court thinks the Finkler question would be a nice a nice way of changing the phrase. He almost doesn't know what, 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 a, what a serious and bitter phrase he's playing with. Yes, the book begins with, with, with Julian, um, the one who'd like to be Jewish, um, being mugged in the street. He's attacked in the street. Uh, and the person who mugs him is a woman. He thinks, but it all happens in such a rush and it's dark you can never be certain whether he's remembering correctly. So nothing is absolutely, nothing should ever be certain in a novel. And this particular incident is full of, full of doubts and questions. But the way he tells it, he's attacked by this woman, a strong woman, who attacks him and takes his phone and takes his wallet and so on. And he lets her have them. He doesn't put up a struggle. Um, but as he goes on thinking about it, he thinks that she said something to him. And he tries to picture what it is that she said as she was stealing his thing. And he thinks that what she said, after he's been through it many times, is, you Jew. He's called Julian. So she could have said, you Julian? But why would she say, you Julian? He doesn't know her. And if she knows him, why would she tell him he's called Julian? You Julian? I know I'm Julian. So he thinks, and, th and finally he's decided that she's called him a Jew. So it's an anti-Semitic attack. So he's interested in, in all this because he thinks, maybe she knows something about me that I don't know. Maybe she recognizes something. Maybe she can see I am Jewish after all. So it's almost as though, ironically, he welcomes, he welcomes that attack, that assault, that mugging, because that mugging is the proof to him that he's Jewish. All absurd, of course. It's all done as, as wild, wild comedy. But it's one of the ways in which he doesn't only, he, he comes to think that he doesn't only want to be a Jew, but what if he is a Jew? 
And of course, one of his friends actually says to him, you know, well, why would you think you're a Jew? Your parents never, you know, your, 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 your name isn't Treslov, that's not Jewish. He said, well, lots of Jews change their name. Could be, that could actually prove I'm Jewish, the fact that I don't have a Jewish name. And you weren't brought up as a Jew? He said, well, lots of Jews weren't brought up as Jews. Your father never mentioned Jewishness. He said, that's the final proof. There was so little said about my being Jewish, I must be Jewish. I never thought, once I started writing, I did think it was good enough. I've liked all my books. My problem was starting, because every time I tried to start, I didn't like what I was doing. I couldn't find a way in. This is, it should be like this. It should be difficult. When I hear of people who are kind of born writing, you know, they're 17 years old and they've published 15 novels, I think something isn't quite right. It should be difficult. And it was difficult. And maybe I took a little too long. I was 35 before I really sat down to write my first novel and it was published when I was about 40. So that's quite old, really. But still, I've managed to write 17 books since then. So that's, you know, and I hope I've got a few more, few more in me. Um, but the, but take too long to talk about why why I was that age before I got going, but possibly I was too ambitious and I wanted to be immediately as good as Dostoevsky or Tolstoy, immediately. Um, and there aren't many people who are as good as Dostoevsky and Tolstoy ever, never mind immediately. So you have to calm down really and realize that you are not any of those people, but somebody else entirely. You find out who you are and mainly you find your voice. And I'm a very voice writer, you know, you hear my voice in my writing and I needed a voice. What it is that makes, I'm always interested in what, what it is that makes a writer, not everybody is a writer. We're going through a little phase at the moment in which everybody thinks they are or should be a writer. But you know, we don't want to live in a world in which everybody is writing books and nobody is reading them. Um, not everybody, it's not, it's not suited to everybody to be a writer. Not everybody has the gift or the temperament. But when one thinks about what makes a writer, I think a writer is always someone who, is, who feels very early on a great dissatisfaction with life. The world as he sees himself in it is not quite right. Because when you write, when you, write you, are, you are remaking life. If you're a novelist, you're re you make a world. You are a godlike figure for a while. You set up in opposition to God. You're in competition with God. God, I don't like your world. Here's my world. It needn't be an idealistic world. It needn't be a world in which you're the hero. But at least you have, a, you have some authority. At least you have some, some, some chance to feel that some, something in life is, within your, is in your hands. Um, and that was, uh, that's how I've always understood, for me, the need, the need to write. Because, and what, made that, what makes me understand that more acutely is that I always wanted to write most when I felt something had happened that had really upset me. Um, and I don't just mean by that, you know, the death of somebody or loneliness or something, but a particular kind of shame or ignominy or insult which really made me feel which made me feel out of kilter with the world, out of harmony with the, with, with the world. And to get back into harmony, to, to just, to, just to feel that I was thriving in the world, writing was a kind of cure for this. If I could write about th this girl who'd just been rude to me, if I could write about that. Not to, be, not to satirize her necessarily, but just to sort of, maybe even to make fun of myself. But if I was making fun of myself, then I was in charge. Jewish jokes are like this. Writing and Jewish jokes have got a lot, in, a, lot, a lot in common, particularly if you're a Jewish writer. A Jewish joke, sort of the basis of every Jewish joke, and most Jewish jokes are, are make fun of Jews. Jews love making fun of themselves. It's really a way of saying, you know, we're sick of you, we're sick of you attacking us, you Nazis, you Cossacks, we're sick of all that. We will attack ourselves. And when we attack ourselves, we'll actually do it better. We'll do it better than you did. You're clumsy. You just use machine guns or, you know, or you come at us with a horse and a, or a camp. We can do much. We use words. We use thoughts. We use ideas. So it's as though you redeem. Literature is a way of literature, a joke and literature, and they can be sometimes the same thing, are ways in which you, the, world, the word is redeemed through the intelligence. Yes, it's important to me to write always that there's a, the, 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 something of the vitality of, of comedy should, for me, should always be there. Um, 
and I value it in other writers um, as well as value it as something that, that, that I do. It's something that I look for as a reader and it's something that I want to do when I am, when I am writing. Um, it's very important to me you know, to, to say again and again that comedy is not the opposite of seriousness. Comedy actually feeds seriousness. I'm always surprised when people will say something like, you can't be funny about something or other because it's too, that's too serious. You can't be funny about the Holocaust. Well, only if by funny you mean being something light. People often think funny means light or devaluing or trivializing. But the great comedy, I think, does the opposite to that. The great com comedy bears a great burden. Um, the great comedy says, if we are to understand something as grave as this, we need all our faculties. We, and we know about comedy when, you know, often at funerals or something, you will see, first time I, I went to a funeral, my dear grandmother, a lady I loved, and I couldn't bear it that my uncles were making jokes in the graveyard. I thought, this is, this is a terrible, and then I realized this was a way, this is a way that you deal with it. When you make a joke, you say life goes on. A joke is an affirmation. Comedy is an affirmation of the, our energy as people. We will, not be, we will not be overcome by the thing that's happened. We're not going to laugh to trivialize it. We're going to laugh because we're going to take it, we're going to face it. We're going to front up to it. And if we can, we're going to achieve mastery over it. Life, after all, you know, nothing in the end matters. For human beings, for the living, nothing matters more than life. Only life matters. And comedy is a great force for, for life. In the number of times in Shakespeare, you know, you talk about Shakespeare himself almost challenges comedy to laugh at the most serious thing. In the, one of the greatest scenes in literature ever written, when Hamlet is in the graveyard and he's holding a com the skull of a comedian, Yorick. You know, we all know that scene of Hamlet in his, and then he's holding the skull. The skull is of a comedian, a jester, and he's talking to the comedian. And Hamlet himself is something of a comedian, but he's a wit. This was a jester who did knock about fun. Hamlet is a wit. Two kinds of comedies are addressing each other in a graveyard, surrounded by death. And then he says to the jester, you who used to have, make everybody roar with laughter, well, go. Go to, go to the lady, to the beautiful lady who's making herself up in the mirror, painting her face and making herself look beautiful. Tell her she'll look like you at the end. Tell her this is what's waiting for her. And he says, make her laugh at that. And I've always seen that as the greatest challenge from the greatest writer to the, to the comedian, to the comic writer, however you want to call him, make us laugh at that. Don't make us laugh because somebody falls over. Don't make us laugh because it's a happy sunny day today. Make us laugh at the very, very hardest thing that life ever has to com confront, which is the end of life. That's the challenge which I feel, you know. Each day when I go to my, when I go to my computer to write, I hear that challenge, make them laugh at that. I have sometimes written books out of a satiric and vengeful impulse or aspects of book, books in which I've sort of thought I'll pay somebody back or there's somebody I don't like or, or something, or maybe even somebody I love that I want to render. And every time I try to render somebody as they are, it doesn't work. And when I try to satirize somebody as they are, it doesn't work. Um, Finkler is nobody I've ever met. Uh, Julian is nobody I've ever met, nobody I've ever met, um, but I understand some of what he's like from, from me. I understand his wondering about Jewishness from me because I don't probably know what Jewishness is. I'm just one of those looking in. I press my, my face against the window of Jewishness. Is it this? Is it that? What is it? So I give that to Julian, but his whole character I know nothing of. Libor, in, in the Finkler question, does have some origins in a man of that age that I met who'd lost his wife, and he did upset me, and, I, and, that, and the grief I felt for him does inform the novel. But he went into places, I mean, he has a, a terrible fate awaits Libor, which has not happened to this particular man in life, and he has a history which has not happened to this man. So you can start from somebody that you know. Um, but I think the way you use the life, I mean, obviously you can only write about the, something you understand. You've, every novelist is to a degree an autobiographer. But when you just simply tell the story of your life, it's not normally very good. If what, the best thing is that you invent. And every time you invent, what you know of life will seep in. So you never actually invent. Everything, everything has come from somewhere. But if you see a particular person when you're writing, for me that doesn't in the end work.